Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to another Facebook Live here. I'm Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And I'm honored to have a good friend and a uh, amazing human being, <laughs> both in his expertise, uh, but also where he comes from as a long-term vegan, passionate about caring and helping for people. You know, we've got a lot of doctors uh, that have come forward in the vegan movement, which is awesome to see. Um, but I see a lot of it being based solely on the research, solely on the science, a lot more in the headspace, uh, the more intellectual approach to, to health and fitness. And what I love about Frank is that he really puts the care back in, in, in what I feel caretaking. And, um, and so I'm really just uh, excited to carry on this conversation and uh, throw some ideas back because there's some amazing advances in, in the research field too. But I also want to explore how we really incorporate that and bring that to people in a humanistic way that comes from our heart. And, and, and um, I, I see more this information confirming what we know intuitively from a heart space, that this is right. And, and I'd like to see more of that in uh, the medical community, really taking care of people as a holistic approach. So Frank, thank you for coming on and thank you for uh, joining me on this. Introduce yourself a little bit about your background, but also make it clear the difference between traditional allopathic medicine and a more holistic or nutritional or preventative approach. Yeah, hi. Well, my, as people know, I'm uh, Dr. Frank Sabatino. I, uh, my background was early on going in the direction of medical training. I wanted to be a medical doctor very early on and I had some health issues in my own life, really as a child into my teenage years, that were resolved by my introduction to living in more of what I'll call a hygienic plant-based manner. Back in the day, we're going back into the 1960s now, you had a field of the natural hygiene movement where you had these physicians that had a long history of looking at the importance of the basic biological requirements of life, food, rest, sunshine, activity, and how they promoted and fostered the health of the human being. Mm -hmm. So getting exposed to that way of living and eating and watching major issues in my own life clear up, recovery and so on, it, it piqued me into wanting to go into a little bit more of an alternative direction. So I decided that chiropractic, being a chiropractic physician, would be more amenable to my thought process and I started, I went in that direction and I knew I could be licensed and work in an alternative, more natural way. And following that up, I got a chance to know many of these hygienic doctors who were applying these principles of natural living and doing also therapeutic water only fasting in major facilities. So I got to be able to study with them, meet them, mentor with them. Some of them were mentors of mine. And that led me on more of the path that I became. And then I decided I became a chiropractor. I went back into research. I decided that I wanted to learn more to be able to bring the research component to this way of living and, and thinking. And then I went on to medical school. I went to Emory Med School and got my PhD in cell biology and neuroendocrinology and, and then went on to be an assistant professor at one of the biggest medical facilities in the world at the University of Texas that did a lot of the original research on calorie restriction and aging. Mm -hmm. And that led me back into then running facilities that were based just on vegan plant-based stuff. And so as I've been, wind up being a plant-based physician for close to 45 years, plant exclusive wow. and raising a family that way. And the difference is, is that, you know, in, in typical allopathic medicine, you know, you're treating effects most of the time. And you're not really getting at the cause of what's driving those outcomes. And the difference between a lot of the plant-based physicians that are from all different schools of, of, of practice is that they look at the cause of disease. They look at the cause of dysfunction. And they also know that a lot of the actions or a lot of the symptoms that medical doctors are treating are nothing more than the actions that the body itself creates for its own benefit, whether that's fever, early inflammation, things of that nature. And so much time is spent trying to suppress that basic ability of the body to heal itself. I always say we're brought up, all of us, to fear our own vitality. 
Yes. Because in every moment that you experience a symptom, someone wants to medicate it out of existence mm -hmm. when in fact it's there for our benefit. So the big difference is we're treating causes, we're adjusting causes, we're changing the choices or helping people make the choices in lifestyle that eliminate the causes of disease rather than getting lost in treating effects and not addressing the primary cause of the problems. And I think that's so important. You know, it's funny when I was in, in college and, and um, my biology professor, you know, I, I was saying, oh, but what about this new study? He goes, well, that's that's really looking at optimal health. We don't look at optimal health. We just treat sickness. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> what is that? Here's the mistake that they make, though. And, and I understand that mentality because the medical system is a disease Yes, it's a disease tree. It's a disease system. You know, it's not a health system. It's not a health care <laughs> system. It's a disease care system. And, and the and, and it, it's important that these diseases uh, that you're treating are not entities in and of themselves. They're 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 a complementary outcome that is the, that is built by the factors and causes and choices that we make. And that's very, very important. And it's important to realize that the same conditions that promote health are the same conditions, whether it's rest, food, sunshine, fresh air, activity, that help you recover health when you've deviated from health. Yeah. In the medical profession, they have this idea that once you're diseased, you now need to take a variety of poisons and medications that in a normal state of health would only call, cause disease. The idea that now you're gonna take a sick person and put something into their body that normally would harm them, and that's going to somehow change its spots and promote health, is just an archaic, ridiculous, you know, uh, untenable notion. So this is a very consistent approach. The things that build health are the same things that help you recover health, except you need them to even a greater degree when you have deviated from health. If you need rest to begin with, if now you're diseased, you need more rest. You don't need no rest, you need more rest. If you need proper food to begin with, you need to be even more adherent to that when you've deviated from health. So it, it, it's such an untenable, unphilosophically connected approach, the way most of the care is, is, do, is do, doled out. You know what I'm saying? Well, and I think we it, it's a compounding of a situation, one that doctors have gotten more and more in bed with the pharmaceutical companies and kickbacks and and even even the laws that govern what practitioners must do the standard of care act says that if you identify a disease state you must tell them about x and x as a prescription because that is the standard care of treatment and they have to do that or they can lose their license so they're 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 entrenched by the laws they're entrenched by the schooling they're supported and financially rewarded by that and of course the pharmaceutical companies, which are doing most of the research, are trying to just prove that their drugs work. So that's what their research is, is, is the information that they have to pull from that is considered legitimate in their spheres. And then on the other side, you've got the consumers more and more less connected to what their responsibility is in exercise and proper nutrition and proper eating. Right. And given all that over to, I'll just ask my doctor and he'll tell me what to do. They've surrendered all of their ability to control their own health and just turned it, oh, I do what my doctor says. Uh, and, you know, I, I've seen my parents uh, actually just follow their doctors and go down that prescription, causing more damage, causing more damage, causing more prescriptions, causing more damage. They're on, uh, you know. Uh, and, and, in many cases, and in many cases, people don't realize how disconnected their medical practitioner is from what the accurate research really is. Correct. Yeah. Heart disease is a classic example. I mean, you if you want, if you know the data related to the causation of heart disease, you have no choice but to go vegan and plant-based. I mean, the data is so entrenched and ridiculously grounded that if you're not practicing that way, you're just really unaware of the research. And I think people, you know, they invest a tremendous amount of hope in medical practitioners. And with all due respect, many of them are not operating from the standpoint of the best research that's out there. No, and I was just uh, online talking about uh, emerging research, the latest research, some of it even coming from AI or in silico data, which is amazing because it, it doesn't have that built-in bias that right. 
paid pharmaceutical research. It's just basically saying, this is the way the body works. And this is what happens when you put a certain element into it. It, it is a little bit, well, a lot bit more free. Obviously, uh, any uh, computer system is only as good as the information that we put into it. But um, it's still, I think that's an amazing field of research that could lift the lid off of some of this implicit bias that's in there. The second part is I, I was in school when I was in school, I was challenging my professors all the time about emerging research. They were saying, no, you have to go by which is in the text, but the text was five years old. And five years in, in research, clinical research, is an eternity. I mean, it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> so, I mean, how can, you know, and then I hear this, uh, this doctor complaining to me saying that, oh, well, that's not based on the, the existing research that is backed and clinically proven. Well, what if you have a disease state like COVID right now? It's a brand new novel virus. We don't have data and it's gonna take two years to get published data on it that is in multiple forms and, and vetted and, and, and long enough study to, to be considered a legitimate. We don't have two years. We have to look at some of this emerging data. We have to make some extrapolation. We have to make some good guesses. And look, if we start with what doesn't harm us first, right? First, do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath. If we can start there by basic nutritional interventions and dietary and, and, and exercise and looking at some of the causality relationships, possible causality relationships. I mean, you- Well, when you, when you, when you look at a, a case like COVID, like you bring up, you know, we, we know the, the things that underlie its greatest morbidity and mortality are certain basic factors like runaway inflammation, for example, like compromise of the protein structure of surfactant of the lungs that's affected by things like glyphosate. We, we know that there are so many factors that we can piece together without having to wait for all of that, knowing how the physiology works that would be supportive. So we know that if you eat in a way that remarkably reduces inflammation, right. you're going to absolutely have a great opportunity to reduce the cytokine cascade in the lungs. Correct. That's going to be the thing that drives pneumonia and people being put on ventilators. We know that if you reduce obesity, you're going to have more available vitamin D, for example. You're going to have less inflammation. You're going to have much more support for the immune apparatus. So there's so many things we know about what's gonna support how the immune system works right. without having to wait for the coronavirus data to generate <laughs> over the next two to three years. So right. why not put in those really supportive prophylactic lifestyle measures and give everybody a chance to reduce the intensity of that infection? And we, have a, we know enough about all of those factors. We know, for example, that vitamin D and physical exercise dramatically reduce upper respiratory tract infections. The data is very, very strong. Well, this disease is a disease of upper respiratory tract infection. Right. So why not impose those conditions right. and give that person a fighting chance? And right. so it's silly, you know, it's silly the way a lot of this is done because it all is going to hinge on, oh, we, we need those magic bullet medications, those antivirals, right. or we need to create this magnificent vaccine. And until then, we can't really be helping anybody with this particular problem. Well, that's just bull. It's just not true, you know? And so there's so many things that people can actually do to help themselves right now. And it really is incumbent upon doctors to be the teachers that they're supposed to be to right. instruct people with those ideas, you know, and they're not, they're not doing it. The mainstream media is not doing it. And you're right. There's a lot of hidden agenda behind it to support the production of very, really what amount to being very expensive and dangerous medications and questionable vaccines. Right. And, and these are just common sense nutritional stuff approaches that do, like you said, have lots of research backing them, both in their safety and in their efficacy in, in bilateral type of situations. So why not at least start there? I agree. It's, it's not going to be harmful. And at the, at the most, it could be helpful. And at the best, it could save lives. I mean, we've got 150,000 people dead already in the United States. Why are we talking about this? And then you you know you talk about it on Facebook and you get shut down as yeah. you know, it's, like, it's, 
Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, so I, it, it's great talking with you because you have that credential, you have that authority that I think a lot of people are looking for to make sure. Because look, there there is a lot of garbage science out there right now that is just being thrown around. A lot of fear porn, unfortunately, a lot of um, you know stuff that it, it's hard to sort through. So. You know, finding that sweet spot where you find the, the trust element. And and that's why I love what you do and why I've always been attracted to your work. You live the lifestyle. You are in it to help people survive, live long, productive, healthy lives. That is what you do. You live that lifestyle yourself. You are an example of it. But you've also done it for so many other people for so long. That to me lends more credence than somebody who's got a, a skin or a bunch of skins on their wall who is following the standard, you know, wait till the drug comes out uh, mentality. You know, on, a, on, on just a humanistic level, cutting through all the research and all of it, when we embrace this lifestyle like you have for a very long time, every day, every choice within that lifestyle approach to me comes down to being just a celebration of life. Yes. I mean, I, I think people need to see it not as a set of rules, not as a, a rigorous approach that's trying to make them be deprived of other foods and fr fractured foods that they may associate with some temporary pleasure. It's truly a celebration of life on every level, your own life, the life of everything around you, the life of the planet. I mean, there's nothing else in terms of lifestyle choice that has that connection to celebrating life at that magnificent level, like this approach. And when you cut through, and, and the, the beautiful part is, is that as we gather research, the research only continues to vindicate and reinforce yes. the power of these approaches over time. And I always find that amazing, that the deeper the research goes, even deepest into the genetic machinery of cells, Yes. You see that it is remarkably being affected in a positive way by this celebration of life. So the choices are affecting every aspect of physiology, every aspect of function, every aspect of synergy, every aspect of our relationship, our, our love of self, our love of life around us, our love of this planet that we're able to gloriously experience it's just a celebration of life at the deepest level and I, I i can't i can't see any other approach in eating or lifestyle that does that i i so agree and it is an intuitive thing it's an experiential thing you can feel the difference when you're doing that and and the look the um, body is such an incredible self-healing machine um it it is and and a lot of people think of diet as, as mostly nutrition. Nutrition is a, is a part of it. But look at our microbiome. I mean, the metabolites that our microbiome alone uh, creates through digestion of polyphenols and fibers and things like this are producing all kinds of different chemicals. That's not the food itself. That's our whole metabolic process. And in that process, there's such a beautiful chain of things going on that is, is a concert. And, you know, I see uh, the old style of allopathic, which is find the broken part and fix it. The old clockwork mentality, right? And all you have to do is tweak the one part. And that's why you see typical pharmaceutical drugs. They upramp something, right? They really upregulate or downregulate something, but they do it to such a degree it sends everything else out of balance. And that's why you have all those symptoms of basic pharmaceutical drugs. They spend half the commercial talking about all the negative symptoms because you just whack the whole system out of balance instead of understanding the whole system itself that nature and our bodies have already formed this synergy of cooperation and our microbiome is such a beautiful thing like the, the lactic acid so it's amazing that there's these uh, part of our micro uh, microbiome probiotics i was just reading about that feed on lactic acid and they what they do because we produce lactic acid when we uh, exercise right so more we exercise, more we're feeding these bacteria. And in return, they're producing metabolites that accelerate our strength, that increase our muscle growth, or be able to do muscle protein turnover. And I'm like, what a beautiful symbiotic relationship. We're feeding and helping each other. 
I love that. And there's so many examples of that going on, both in our microbiome and the synergy of the foods we eat with all the phytonutrients and all the polyphenols. And I know you've done some great research in that field, so I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, the, if, you, if you follow that thread, it, it, it takes you into this the most incredible, wonderful rabbit hole and looking glass. It takes you to a place <laughs> You know, uh, break on through to the other side. I love that line. <laughs> Your song. Uh, if, if you think about it, when you eat a diversity of plants, those fibers, which of course many of which we can't digest, feed the population of bacteria and organisms in the gut, what we're calling the gut microbiota, which has its own genetic machinery called the gut microbiome, but let's call it the GM, the gut microbiota. Those organisms, especially the ones that are promoted by plants, which are those lactic acid bacteria, like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and so on, and they produce the little short-chain fatty acids that inspire the plush mucous membrane of the large intestine, which, by the way, is one of the most important parts of the innate immune system. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. starts right there, establishing mm -hmm. the best scenario of immunity that you can. Mm -hmm. And then what's intriguing is as you put those plant-based foods and as you make the point, the gut microbiome can convert the isothiocyanates from broccoli and cruciferous veggies, the polyphenols from, you know, turmeric and nuts and berries and so on. And it converts them in, in a way that actually starts to promote methylation, changes in the genetic machinery of the cells. Yes. that literally prevent and turn off cancer-promoting genes. Yeah. I want you to think about that thread from a fiber <laughs> intake to triggering the foundation of the immune system to triggering the gut microbiome to produce proteins that now work enzymatically to modify the major plant-based nutrients in the most powerful plant-based foods we can eat that then go into the genetic machinery and will either methylate the genetic DNA directly, or they'll modify the proteins that corral the DNA to expose tumor suppressor sites that yes. when they're activated will suppress cancer. I mean, you can't make that up. I mean, it, it's just so unbelievable to see that thread of beauty that, that as you follow it down to the deepest core of cellular function, the plant-based world, the plant-based choices are triggering the most profound benefit at the deepest cellular level. It's amazing, it's just amazing to me. It is, and, 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 and looking, the more we understand the microbiome, it's more and more apparent what we should be putting into our digestive tract. You literally have animal products producing cadaverines and putrezines and toxic materials, and then you have plant products metabolized by the gut, microbiome producing all the beneficial materials. I mean, it's really clear just by looking at our gut that we are herbivorous by nature, by design. You know, I was looking at the one of the studies on uh, K2 and the whole argument was, oh, you can't get enough K2. K2 is the form of vitamin K that our body uses for certain functions, including bone health. And, and, and K1 is found in plants and they said, oh, but that's K1 you need it in K2 state. Well, it was interesting. They said, oh, we don't convert enough, right? The conversion is too low. But when they looked at plant-based eaters, vegans, they found that the gut microbiome increased the, the exact flora that were converting the uh, K1 to K2. So by and, feeding and them the fiber it. in the plants, they were increasing the amount of K2. It, but See, they were never looking at vegans in these studies before. They were making assumptions based on the standard American diet that says, okay, this must be true for everyone. And it's not. As soon as you change the diet, all of the rest of the cascading effects that you just talked about also change. Right. And that was the same argument. And, and again, it's the same argument that applied to B12. We, we know that B vitamins, including B12, are produced by bacterial, you know, bacterial metabolism. And the bottom line is, I really believe, again, because there are many vegans that don't supplement, that don't have deficiency. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the B12 produced by the gut microbiome, biota, is profound, too. 
And I think many times the processed foods that we consume that are not allowing that population of organisms to be fed correctively are, are because you're absorbing a lot of those foods higher up in the small intestine. You don't have fiber in that denatured processed food that's making its way to the large bowel. So those organisms become compromised. You start favoring more endotoxic organisms. You start damaging the gut lining with leaky gut. You start getting the immune and inflammatory changes. And, and, and again, you're not getting the B vitamin production even from those bacteria, but they produce quite a bit. And so this is very important. The plant-based use and the impact on the microbiota has really opened up a Pandora's box of understanding so much more value to the plant-based food consumption that we're supposed to be eating. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's great that we're finally getting to this place in the research uh, to confirm it. But I loved what you said on my post the other day. It was about, about some of the research is that wh why is it taking us this long to, to know something we should know intuitively? You know, we feel compelled to have to do research to impress upon ourselves that we need to eat fruits and vegetables. I find that interesting. Nobody cared, nobody cared when we were drowning in milk, cheese, and animal fat. Exactly. But, but once we're really, you know, diving into mangoes and pineapples and greens, you better have research that shows you. I find that very funny. It's actually laughable in a way. It, it is, but it's sad because what we're experiencing right now is nearly 60% obesity states in the United States. And, you know, I just heard um, the statistics that in the, what was it, the 1940s, I think, that there was about 10% obesity in the United States. It's now over 40% um, and, and closing and in on- two, And two out of three people are overweight. So if you just get into overweight, it's, like you said, it's over 60%. It's ridiculous. And that's, that's so sad because that, that just leads to a whole cascade of dysfunction of the body. I mean, diabetes, what is kind of coined the term loosely called today. I mean, you look at diabetes, hypertension, uh, they're all tied. It's all metabolic syndrome. And, and obesity is the alarm going off saying you need to change something. Including many forms of cancer, which we know yeah, are obesity correct. related. Yeah. Well, not only obesity, you got with all that fat, fat creates estrogen that those estrogen dependent cancers are just yeah. being fed. <laughs> well, you've got that high increase in aromatase. So all the testosterone Correct. gets converted into estrogen. But and you got to understand that, you know, for the longest time, people saw fat cells as being kind of just these inert cells that maybe made us look a little less attractive cosmetically. What they didn't realize is that these fat cells are functioning almost like an organ unto themselves. Mm -hmm. They have their own population of cytokines. They have their own population of pro-inflammatory chemicals that create ongoing tissue damage. That's the foundation for most cancers and chronic disease. So when we look at obesity, we're looking at a serious, serious health issue. And I was, I was reading, the, it was a funny thing, uh, reading about um, the leading statistical um, thing put out by the Lancet of what contributes to health. And there were there were some that were obvious that are should be to everyone, which is uh, smoking and, and drinking alcohol. But all the rest were diet related. And all of them basically all said the one thing, which is reduce animal proteins and, and, and cholesterol, which is only from animals, and increase fiber, fruits, nuts, vegetables, all the plants. I mean, Every single one of them on the list, other than air pollution, uh, smoking, which is basically air pollution that you're doing intentionally, and, and drinking alcohol, everything else, oh, I, I take that back. Number four on the list was lack of exercise, which is very important, which yes, is absolutely. You know, <laughs> why I focus so much on, on fitness, and, um, and I think that's an integral part of our overall health, too. No, it's exciting when you see it all come together, but it's so funny that we've got something that is so polar, which is you eat the animal products and you can see the whole cascade of deleterious effects. You eat the plant products and it's whole plant, uh, obviously state, non-processed. And then you see its whole cascade of positive effects. There's nothing that could have been more clear. Why is this, why do you think this is not more widely accepted in the medical community that's seeing all this research? Um, 
again, I think they become somewhat disconnected. Let's take the heart disease data itself. The studies by Ornish, Esselstyn, and all of those have been entrenched for a while. And yet, how many cardiologists really live with that? They really don't. I mean, you've got people like uh, Kim Williams, who's the head of a major department of cardiology, and you've got people like that that are doing it. But for the most part, they're much more tuned into bypasses and stents and surgical procedures and medications. And, and it has a lot to do with systems of, uh, again, agendas related to systems of wealth and money. And we know that. We know that a lot of these approaches in the food industry are tied into selling products that have been in, that are entrenched, loaded with salt, oil, and sugar, feeding addiction, driving people to overeat on things that are making them ungodly fat and sick and diseased. Um, that's why, although these foods are not perfect, the movement to substitution vegan products has value because now, at least, you know, the bigger corporations realize that if people are going to spend money on a plant-based product, we're going to be in the business of producing it because money drives the machine. So in a way, while those products, many of them are not perfect for health, they right. bring people into the fold and they're urging corporations and things to move away from the animal products to some degree. But it all comes down to vested interest in money right. and in procedures. I, I think you, you probably saw in that movie, What to Health, is one particular point where the guy goes in and he's challenging the surgical department of this hospital uh, with the idea that if you did this and this and plant, you would be doing less surgeries. And basically the person looks up and says, well, why do we want to do that? Because they have a quota of how much they need to achieve in those departments to stay stable financially. So they're not looking for someone to wipe out the need for all surgery. There's vested interest in that. And that's true with medications. That's true with foods. That's true with many things. So as we teach what we do, we're really teaching a fundamental truth that takes its time, but it's moving its way into the general consciousness. And that's what's going to happen. And then what will happen is the, the power of the dollar, the buying power of the individual then exerts pressure with their dollar to urge business to meet the demand that they're seeking. And that's how it changes, but it's not something that changes overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just listening to a, a Harvard professor talking about all the advantages to health, all the research that is showing a plant-based diet is the way to go. And then they asked, so what do you eat? And he goes, well, I eat the standard American diet. Basically. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, you know, it's uh, you got, you got to ask the question, why? Knowing what you do, why would you do exactly. that? Exactly. I mean, he was just preaching the health benefits, the environmental impact, the economic impact, all the research behind it. And then he goes ahead and eats it. <laughs> There's a lot of doctors. And, and this is very interesting. I'm still shocked to this day how many gastroenterologists, specialists, Yes. You know, there's no relationship between what you eat and what happens in the gut. Wow. And the pathologies that occur in the gut. They don't have, they feel, I don't have the time for that. It's not important. Uh, just take the medication. Do what you have to do. We'll do the surgical procedure we have to do. And wow. it's the same with cancer. If you go into MD Anderson or places like Sloan Kettering and you go downstairs in the cafeteria, they got vending machines with junk food all over the place. <sighs> And so there's no can because they feel that it's not doesn't matter. Our treatment is what matters. You know, what we're doing with radiation and chemo is what matters. This doesn't matter as much. And we know that that's categorically untrue. But the bottom line is it's very intriguing. That's why I like the fact that you have people like uh, Dr. Michael Clapper trying to go into medical schools and yes. the curriculum, helping these young budding doctors realize the power of plant-based work and counseling and healthcare. So, you know, you need to have those kind of grassroots efforts yep. to change these well entrenched situations, but it's really strange out there. It's really interesting. You got, you know, you got the plantrician project, you got a lot of plant-based physicians now, but let's face it, you still got many who don't think there's any relationship between lifestyle factors, health, food choices, and the outcome of health. And it's bizarre to me. It's bizarre because it is what's causing most of our disease states. And I think Dr. Greger, with his, his book on how not to die, really 
clearly painted a great picture on that. But even economically, if you look at businesses, I mean, I know on one side, economically, right, trillions of dollars have gone into uh, cancer research. And, and how many cancer cures have they come up with? Yeah, nothing, right? And it's because they don't want to cure. If you cure cancer, they don't get to treat it. They make money on treating cancer. And they get to make money on investing and looking for cures. That's where all that money is coming. They don't want that money to go away. So nobody really wants a cure. I mean, ethically, you can't say that. Of course, we all want to end that. But when you look at diet and, and how much that plays a part in it, and you look at health factors that we can control and how much that plays a factor in it, yeah, there is there is genetic flaws in some people, you know, or exposure to radioactivity or stuff like that that can cause it. But that's a few percentage. We're talking about the vast majority, 90, 95 percent of people. This is diet related stuff and that the body can heal itself. We, we're killing cancer cells all day long, you know, and, and that's part of the natural process. What's wrong is when we overload that process with negative attributes that our body just can't keep up with, can't do that. That's why I love to talk about fasting because that is so important. I was a big fan of fasting. I've done a lot of it myself. And um, so important to just get the F out of the way sometimes and let the body heal itself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, fasting has always been the intelligent art of doing nothing but doing it intelligently because yeah. – Generally speaking, you know, when we look at healing and we look at the body, the body's always trying to heal whatever it needs to heal. No one needs to tell the liver how to do all the functions that it does. Right. But we need to remove the burden on the body that may urge those organs to have to overwork to such a degree that they can become compromised. So in fasting, you're taking this approach where by eliminating all of nutritional intake, with water alone in a maximum resting state. You're harboring all of the energy of the system that would be tied up in digestion, food appropriation, food, you know, food preparation, and you're making that energy available for whatever the body in its wisdom and intelligence sees fit to do and needs to do in that moment. So I tell people it's not a magical process. It's basically a resting process. It's a deep, physiological resting process. But what you do is by taking those nutrients away, the body needs to now avail itself of energy by leaning on fat reserves, so it shifts into a ketogenesis that now allows it to avail itself of energy from your fat reserves and storage areas where there can be the accumulation of toxic debris, toxic waste, which now becomes mobilized, removed from the body under the energetics of fasting. So you have this huge detoxification effect, inflammatory processes brought down. And when cells are deprived of nutrients, it triggers an uh, autophagic pathway in the cells yes. where the body moves into house cleaning and repair rather than growth and reproduction because right. it doesn't have the nutrients. And it goes through this massive cleaning up, stabilizing process. I tell people, I, I liken it to, imagine if you had a room and in the corner of the room, you had broken wood and rusty nails. And from that, you could build the Taj Mahal. That's what happens in autophagy. <laughs> Body takes all the broken down structural proteins. It takes all of the debris of cells and it literally takes from them what it can to restructure and stabilize the tissue at hand. And we see that as a fundamental part of the fasting process. And that's why many times in fasting, you can see tumors or growths or cysts completely dissolved in the fasting state, while the body takes from them what it can use to support the vital organs and tissues of the body and gets rid of debris that it no longer needs. So fasting has a tremendous impact on house cleaning, detoxification, reducing inflammation, regenerating and rebooting the immune system. So many pieces happen in that fasting state and all it takes is to be in a resting state and a short period of calorie elimination, basically. Yes, and, and folks, there are, I do want to say to our audience, there is proper ways to do this and the best way is under the supervision of a practitioner who is trained and understands that. 
uh, people who have uh, blood sugar regulation issues and things like this can create problems. And being in a supervised state, being doing this with a professional is the way to go. So just I will I will tell them that there's an organization called the National Health Association, and their website is healthscience.org. They have a list of all of the trained right. They have a list of all of the people, doctors that have done apprenticeships and training in the supervision of water only fasting. And I would urge people that if you're going to do this for some pathological purpose, make sure you get under the care of one of those well-trained physicians. It'll be in your best interest. So that's, uh, again, health science. And you can see uh, uh, our good friend yeah, here. Yeah, article on the immune system. <laughs> so that's Dr. Frank Sabatoon writing articles for, for health science, um, too, as well. Great group. Um, used to be called the Natural Hygiene Society and um, is based on uh, uh, some basic principles of sound health uh, that I think every human being should incorporate to a more and more extent. Um, there, let's talk about food fear for a little bit because uh, I know there's a lot of people, not a lot, but there are people out there, you know, it's like, oh, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this to the point where people are getting into a little bit of health paralysis, scared to do anything. Oh, I read this, you know, eating a eating a fig can actually be toxic to you or eating a grape, you know, it's like, it's like, ha, ah, you know, that we become almost paralyzed with it or don't drink a smoothie because it's broken down too small. And I'm like, you know, we, need, we need to really stop the insanity. I mean, really, the truth of the matter is the whole area of fruit consumption has been so maligned through the years when it is one of the most important components of human nutrition, in my opinion. Now, has fruit been hybridized in our society? Yes, it has. Has it been compromised in some of the ways that it's grown and handled? Probably. So I would urge you to get probably the best source of organic fruit that you can get, but there is no way that you do not want to have massive and huge and really comfortable amounts of fresh fruit in your diet. I eat huge amounts of fruit daily. From the standpoint of sustaining energy, weight loss, weight regulation, health, performance and you know even in weight training how important fruit can be for the overall nutritional input of the bodybuilder and the person really i mean it, it's it's been laughable to me that as human primates we have battled this idea of eating fruit and i know you have groups like people in hippocrates that we know that when you have sugars excessive sugars in the system it can feed cancer growth but there's not a lot of evidence that the use of fructose in the form of high fiber, really soluble fiber, good, fresh, right. organic fruit does that. And right. my personal feeling is the antioxidants and the phytonutrients that are in fruit are so off the charts yes. in the colors and textures of fruits that it, it, it really is a huge mistake not to incorporate fruit in your overall eating plan. That's just my basic opinion. Yeah, and it's backed up by the uh, the Lancet journal that I was talking about. Uh, they put uh, number one as far as food that you could reduce your risk of all-cause mortality by 40% for nuts and seeds. And number two on that list was increasing your fruit intake. And that could decrease your your um, uh, all-cause mortality by 30%. And think so, about this. Fruit's the only food that you will pick and eat without thinking about how you're going to prepare it. I mean, exactly. You don't think about steaming or sauteing the mango right. in its natural state. It's most natural for you. So we are natural fruit eaters. Fruit has to, you know, from babe, from infancy on, it's the food that you will eat in its most natural state and be gravitate toward it most dramatically because it has the taste sensation that suits us as primates. So it's always been silly to me that people have made this effort to malign fruit the way they have. Totally. And, and, you know, it's funny, you know, people say the, the fruit and the glucose. And then I'm like, do you know what one of the top diabetes drugs is based on? A polyphenol called fluoridzin that's found in the skin of apples. That's right. Our top diabetes drugs, which regulates sugar into our system, is found in the skin of an apple. I mean, you know, it's like you're not seeing the whole picture. They're saying, oh, there's sugar in that fruit, not understanding the fiber content slows it down. The polyphenols have a regulatory effect on it, have a binding effect, have the way it's used and metabolized with the liver, all of that. You've got to look at the whole fruit. 
you know, our good friends at Mastering Diabetes, Ronnie and Cy, mm -hmm. they're type 1 diabetics that for decades, for the, for years, they've been demonstrating how fruit consumption even modifies the type 1 diabetic in a healthy direction. So it's always been a, a very bizarre notion. People never really understood that fruit sugars or sugars in plants are not the problem in diabetes. It's saturated fat that's the problem. Yes because it blocks insulin's ability to enter muscle and liver cells. Yes. And so you create an insulin resistance where sugar levels now will rise and you have no choice but to store that as fat. And so the bottom line is, you know, it's always been taught in a very ass backward way. Yeah. If you want to worry about a food that's going to hurt you diabetically, you better worry about animal fat more than you yeah. worry about fruit sugar. I'll guarantee you that. A hundred percent. I mean, it's real simple. Fat has a lot more calories. It's a lot harder to transfer. Sugar is very simple for our body to process into energy in the ATP cycle. And and then when it gums up the inside of the cell and you have all this stuff, the, the receptor sites on the outside of the cell just shut down and say, hey, look, I don't need to take any more. I've got more than enough energy in here. So it's that fat that's causing it. Now, when that sugar can't get into the cell because you've shut down or type two insulin resistance, then, then the body says, well, what do I do with this sugar? Unfortunately, we're eating a lot of this processed sugar, this free floating glucose that is just coursing through our veins and it glycates. And these AGEs then become damaging. That's why we have blindness. Uh, diabetes is the number one cause of blindness, number one cause of loss of limbs. I mean, they're damaging to our, our cells, to our, our arteries. And God, it, it's just... And, and gly glycation, people need to understand the production yeah. of uh, endogenous AGEs was one of the biggest hypotheses for the science of aging meaning that when animals were calorie restricted, the glycation went down so significantly that it was one of the components that they linked as one of the major benefits for anti-aging. So what you said is very important for how we age effectively, and we will age prematurely when those AGEs are increased by those glycation effects that you mentioned. Yeah, and, and again, the science community knows about this. So as, as much I am a fan about some of the emerging, the new research that's really painting a picture about what we should be eating. I'm really surprised that we're still stuck in, in a the overall um, scientific community, still stuck at saying, wow, that's a problem and not looking at what the root cause of that is. And addressing we still have the American Diabetic Association still recommending the same diet it has for the past 50 years which is high in animal-based products, high in dairy, animal foods, and the like, and, and, and the elimination of fruits and basic, simple plant-based carbohydrates. It's a huge, huge mistake and a disconnect. I mean, it's such a huge disconnect. That, that, that uh, PCRM uh, just recent, where they did the two uh, type 1 diabetes uh, folks, and they took them from a ultra-low carb, 50 carbs a day, and they increased them to like 400, 500 carbs, and their insulin started becoming more sensitized. They were more improved in, in, in that, and they healed the body in that process. So the whole, the exact opposite of what the majority of is, stay away from the sugar, stay away from the carbohydrates, actually helped them turn around type one diabetes, which was thought to be unheard of. It was unbelievable. That, that's why in the centers and the plenty of retreat centers that I've worked at for many, many years, one of the easiest things to treat is the adult onset diabetic, the type two diabetic with this lifestyle. Yes. I mean, it's so amenable to changing that very quickly. And reversible, you know, we thought and some of these diseases that you couldn't have, you got them, you're stuck with them, right? And no, that's not the case. You know, when I when you talked about um, uh, fasting, which is great, um, it, it really kind of made me think of an analogy that fasting is resting your body from from eating. And obviously, eating takes a huge amount of our energy. So um, what about 30, 35% of our energy is consumed on a daily basis just in processing food. So when we can free up all that energy, we can do that. Well, think about sleep. We all sleep roughly about eight hours a day. Imagine what you did if you went two to three days without any sleep, how broken down you would be. But that's exactly what we're doing in our common dietary pattern habits right now. I mean, 
that's a very clear example. You can't go two days without sleep without feeling <laughs> trashed. Like hell, right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And why aren't we giving that kind of rest and consideration to our own physiology through, through our dietary habits? When you talk about something like fruit that is so easy for our body to metabolize and digest and actually helpful, it assists our microbiome, it reduces the the gunk and the the elimination of, of negative particles it allow increases bioavailability increases absorption it does all these things that benefit our nutrient uptake and and then you see the just exact opposite when you get the highly processed foods and the animal foods in there starting to gum up the body you know the putrefaction of animal products inside the digestive tract and our body then secretes a mucus layer right to protect against putrefied toxic material it's a natural protection but unfortunately if you keep doing that you keep building up this mucosa and particles get lodged and you can form and 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 it's very clear eating animal products can lead to colon cancer very clear connection. There's no doubt, I think, in any simple practitioner's mind, that is probably one of the most clear connections that we've seen. Yet I talked to a guy who was 37 years old and had six feet of his colon removed already. 36? I'm like, are you kidding? And another friend I was talking to, esophageal cancer, because they're putting so much crap in their stomach, their body is overproducing you know, um, digestive enzymes, and it's eating away at his own throat and getting his throat removed. I mean, really? We go to these, that's extreme. <laughs> you know, yeah. having, having that type of situation and still not listening to your body that what you're putting in it is damaging it. Amazing. <laughs> and, and and that's why I'm so thankful for what you're doing and, and, um, and, and bringing this common which should be common sense to people but i think there's still a lot of fence sitters who don't understand don't trust because they've been told hammered and hammered by their doctors and by the old school teaching and even by the textbooks in their own schools we grew up with you know you need 200 grams of protein that was in our textbooks <laughs> you know the four food groups in my pyramid remember that i grew up, grew up with that that was on <laughs> that was in every cafeteria of every middle and elementary school in the 50s and 60s think about that and two of the basic four food groups were meat and dairy meat and dairy 50 percent of your diet should be meat and dairy and people never thought to turn those charts around because on the bottom it said funded by the american dairy council exactly charts which is interesting it, one yeah. of the most successful yeah. advertising campaigns to get people to buy all, and use all, more all the products. Buy hard and also understand that a lot of those fractured and processed foods feed, feed their own addictive quality. And so what happens is you engender addictive process in the human body and in the human brain to many of those products. And sometimes you've got to give yourself a period of time away from the addictive quality of those foods for the body to be able to get back mm -hmm. to appreciate the taste and nuances of healthy food. And yes. so there's that too that plays into that picture. And that's, of course, how those industries have become entrenched. If you think about it, most of the processed foods that are sold are fundamentally tasteless. They're mm -hmm. basically cardboard-like compounds that taste not like nothing. So what mm -hmm. self-respecting primate like you and me is going to go out and pluck down your hard-earned cash to buy products that are fundamentally tasteless? No one. So what are you going to have to add back? to make it palatable. Well, the two most sensitive things on your tongue are salt and sugar. Yes. So those become the two biggest additives along with oil in the junk food industry. Yeah. So it's no mystery how that process has been engendered and entrenched. That's why when we put people in our centers, we give them not only a plant-based approach, but we do it non-SOS. There's no added salt, oil, or sugar. Mm -hmm. So we take it up another notch in terms of the plant-based approach and that helps really break food addiction and then they can start tasting the nuances in a piece of lettuce or you know all the taste that nature mm -hmm. provides that we were we were being cut off from I and mean, it's ridiculous to, to resensitize my sister had to uh, go on a, a strictly salt-free diet because uh, she had uh, complications with her pregnancy and um and uh, she tried something with salt in it, and like she's like, "Oh, that burned my tongue." Yeah, 
but for everybody else, it was just normal. And that's how desensitized that you don't even know that you're that desensitized until you <laughs> back out of it. And you don't see what also you don't get to experience what also is is not there when you're overloading. And, and the, that's one of the really real benefits of water only fasting. There's an incredible escalation and sensitivity in the mouth to all the different tastes of foods. So you get a tremendous increase in taste sensitivity following water only fasting, which is great. Yeah, and I think one of the other major things that fortunately I think modern science is really starting to move out of, and that is epigenetics. It used to be the old gene theory, which is if you have a gene, that's it. You're stuck with it. You're born with it. You're gonna, you're, you have a genetic disposition, you're gonna get cancer. Your father got cancer, you're gonna get cancer. And now we know with epigenetics, these genes can be turned on and off by what we do, what we eat, our exercise. Even things like laughter and smiling can switch, epi, uh, epi, make epigenetic changes in our body. Look, the, the, uh, the original study Ornish did with prostate cancer showed that following a plant-based approach for over just really like a three-month period turned, turned on or turned off over 450 genes involved in cancer expression. Think about that. Uh, we know that when women exercise as little as 25 minutes three times a week, there are over 43 genes turned off, three of which are directly related to breast cancer promotion. So, you know, we see and in stress management, simple stress management, even 12 minutes a day, so dramatically changes telomere length on chromosomes that affect the aging process. So we now know that while there has always been genetic machinery, we yes. now know that what you do in lifestyle choices superimposes on that machinery to yes. turn on and turn off whole fractions and whole pieces of those chrom that chromosome genetic machinery to either express or not express diseases like cancer or heart disease or yeah. any number of other outcomes. So people need to realize the power that they have in personal choice and not drown in their own gene pool. They need to realize that this is not something they have to be imprisoned by. That while it may be there, what you choose to do has a huge yeah. impact as to what expresses or does not express in that genetic machinery. And that's an empowering story. We took it out of a disempowerment that you're born with it, you're stuck with it, that's your fate of cards, right. you know. Uh, and, and now it's, hey, wait a minute, what I do matters. And that's such a beautiful story. And it should be an empowering enough story. And I see the changes happening in the mainstream. I just posted today uh, about one of the largest investor groups with trillions of dollars in their portfolio is, is now saying that 2020 is really the year of plant-based and that 40% of the top CPG companies in the world now have dedicated teams to developing and producing plant-based uh, products. It's amazing. So the, the, the change over a, a $1.1 billion in investments just this year so far, which yeah. eclipsed all of the monies last year. So it's amazing to see. And, and look, it's, <laughs> it makes economic sense too. You know, d causing ill health to the people you're selling the products to is not going to get you a positive re feedback response. If you are killing your customers, they're not going to be buyers for you. So and it does If you have if you have two out of three people that are overweight and you've got 40% plus people that are obese, with all the outcome of disease and stuff that will come from that, no one will be able to afford that as a population, the treatment of the endpoint of that morbidity. So people need to realize that this affects us on so many levels that are not just biological and physiological. They affect us on, again, economic levels, on spiritual levels, on emotional, yeah. and psychological. Yeah. This is a huge, huge piece. This movement into plant-based is, uh, it's almost mandatory at this point. I mean, in my opinion, it's a mandatory shift that has to occur. Yeah, I mean, from the pandemics to climate change, we're, we're affecting globally our economy, our environment. I mean, over a trillion animals killed in our food supply and 30% yeah, of them just abysmal. thrown away as food waste. It's abysmal. And when you think about the fact that 80% plus of, you know, uh, grain that's produced is fed to farm animals and not people, 
while you have 9,000, between 9 and 12,000 children that die every single day from starvation. Every single day. So when you get up in the morning, another 10,000 children have died because they can't access a food supply that's being fed to factory farm animals that are only reinforcing devastation, disease, and, and the despicable outcome that goes on in that kind of food production. Uh, it, it's just unconscionable to me. It is. But on, and on the flip side, you, it is empowering that we can retake control over our lives, of our health. You do not have to go down the path of when I hit 40, I'm going to have, be fat. I'm going to get sick. I'm going to have disease states. I'm going to the hospital. I have to take six prescriptions. You don't have to follow that path. Um, I don't mind if you want to share your age and how long you've been vegan. <laughs> I've been vegan for, I, like I, I, Michael Clapper and I laugh about it. It's like the country song. We were doing this when it wasn't cool. <laughs> it's cool now, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, this year I'll be 70. And you know, look, the last doctor I saw was almost 55 to 60 years ago. And not a drop of medication. You know, I run 10% body fat, cholesterol level 125. I mean, the truth of the matter is, if you live this way, Nobody knows what you're capable of achieving right. you know, unless you're looking at blue zone cultures. We have some idea. But the truth of the matter is there's not a lot of models for people, you know, living in these advanced ages, adopting these ways of living. But I'm here to tell you that on a performance level, on every aspect of life that you want to achieve, the things you want to do, the performance you want to have, there's really no limit at any age that what occurs when you adopt this way of living and eating. And I, I want to impress upon people how important that is. You do not have to look, we all, if, 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 and when we die, we want to go out like the blowing out of a candle. We don't want to have, we want to compress morbidity into the one single breath of blowing out a candle. We don't want to have these decades of morbidity where doctors are saying, yeah, he's living longer or he's lasting longer, but he's not really living longer. What's the point? You want to have that ability to celebrate life, to perform, to do the things you would love to achieve, even in the very advanced stages of your life. And I'm here to tell you that this way of living and eating is what really allows that to happen. That's true. And when I when I hear things in the scientific community like uh, junk science, well, we don't know what's, you know, X percentage of the of the uh, I mean, junk uh, DNA like, OK, our body is, works on conservation of energy. It doesn't have anything there that it doesn't use. And if it's not being used, it breaks it down and gets rid of it. Right. So, um, you know, and we say, oh, we don't know what two thirds of the brain is used for. OK, these are potentials. These are things that we may not have been tapped into. I, I remember loving a story about uh, they took some yogis who had been uh, chased, uh, not practiced, abstinent uh, for a long period of time. And they said, well, I wonder what their testes are, are doing since they're not using them for sexuality. And their testes were producing a chemical. So they put a biotracer on it to see where it was going. And it was going to the brain, to the parts that were accelerating their meditation. And then I saw another one where they took a part of the adrenal gland and grafted it to the spinal cord on a spinal cord injury person. And it started producing opiate signals to the brain, relieving them of all their pain. We're not asking the body to do it. We get so entrenched in our behavior of doing things repeatedly it's only when we break out, only when we make changes, do we start to discover some of these things that our body can do, that has the potential to do. How many superpowers are just waiting there for us to be used? And that, <laughs> that's fundamental to what you know scientists like to call neuroplasticity, because it yes. is the real thing. If you engender a state of happiness, yes. the pathways associated with that construct become more and more developed. You'll see synapses, you'll see pathways that are linked with centers of the brain that engender that outcome. If you uh, remove a body part, other parts of the brain will start to pick up the slack to reinforce the outcome of that function. So we, we see the capability of the body and brain even in advanced stages, because the idea before was when you got older, the brain had no ability to be plastic or to change. You were on one uh, kind of downslope toward death, 
there was redundancy, many cells produced, but you weren't making new ones. Well, we now know you have neural derived growth factors in the brain that are triggered by physical activity. They're triggered by optimism. They're triggered by states of, you know, uh, healthier states of emotional interaction. They're triggered by meditation. So we now know that a lot of these lifestyle factors are triggering the deepest changes at a neurological and hormonal level that we never even thought was possible. And we're just starting to understand how powerful that really is. Well, and, and a great story I read about a, um, a physicist in the UK who just completed his second PhD at 60 uh, with two thirds of his brain missing. He had hydroencephaly, so the water had, had taken over about two thirds of his brain. But through neuroplasticity, his brain had, had readapted to function at a PhD level, even with two thirds of it. Not. There are actually many people that are born with half a brain. It's a, a, a medical condition. I remember doing a course once with a neuroscientist who was called Carl Pribram. Carl Pribram is the man who first presented the holographic model of the brain. Yes. He was a neurosurgeon. He did the, he did the original work with Washo the chimp and Washo bit off one of his fingers. He had four fingers on one hand. I got to know Carl. And uh, the bottom line is he talked about a story of someone coming into an emergency room with a hunting knife stuck in the side of their head, a big blade knife right into that whole half of the brain. And the way they take that out is they put the body on the floor, put both feet on the side of his head and yank it out, just the way you would think you would have to. And <laughs> after all of that, there wasn't one drop loss of neurological function at all. Nothing. Amazing. So, you know, there's so much stuff that we are so unaware of in terms of the plasticity of the brain and the spinal cord. And it's just really remarkable. It is. Well, this has been an amazing discussion. I, I wish we could go on forever because I could. I always enjoy yeah, we talking. Went, we went over an hour. Right? It's amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming on and sharing some of your wisdom with uh, my audience. How can they get in touch with you? I know some people asked about. Uh, Dusty was asking about. I got a, um, my my personal website is drfranksabatino.com, and I will tell you that on that site, on the homepage. There is a course that I did recently that was moderated by Chef AJ called Lean for Life, The Science of Effective Weight Loss. It's mm -hmm. literally a 13 module course. It's the most comprehensive approach to dealing with the problem of obesity. And if you have anybody suffering with that issue, that's why I created it. So do that. And that's drfranksabatino.com. And I'm also Dr. Uh, drfsabatino at gmail.com if you need to reach me by email. So you can get me in those two ways. And social media, are you? I'm... Just my Facebook page. That's all I really keep on social media. That's okay. under Frank Sabatino. So there's a Facebook page too. Awesome. I will tell you this, on the homepage of the drfranksabatino.com, I have a free ebook. It's a free gift that if someone submits their personal information, it's called a plant-based guide to eating out in the real world. So I take you through the ethnic restaurants in your community to show you how to do this with pictures and descriptions and all of that. And it's really for people in transition that always are concerned, how am I going to socialize and what am I going to do? So I created it for that purpose. And that's a free gift. So people can go and get that for free. That's awesome. And I think it's, it's important to just on a parting note to remember that there are lots of people in varying steps from the very first baby steps all the way down to the advanced uh, progress in, in diet. Um, so it's speaking to people at where they're at and applauding them at every stage of their-, of their Remember, the, uh, the, the most important nutritional ingredient is love, always. And, yeah. and you, want to you want to reach people where they are and you want to love them where they are. And really the fundamental basis of this whole approach is empathy and compassion. Yeah. And too often what happens is we can become very militant with the message and yes. we lose sight of what really is fundamental to the message, and that is compassion and empathy. And I urge people out there to have that not only with others, but have it with yourself. Even when you go off track or what you think is off track, come back, embrace yourself, love yourself, get back on it. And that's how we all grow and evolve anyway. And that is a beautiful and perfect way to end this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Likewise. Bye.